buenas tardes y eh, bienvenidas, eh, bienvenidos a esta. Welcome on this to this online session on Qatar Middle Power Mediator. We're going to analyze along with certain experts the role played by this small country in the Gulf. We will go through its development over the last decade to become what it is today. The seminar is going to take place in English, so those of you who are used to online sessions, you know how it works. Uh, it's been a while since uh, the last uh, session we held online because we went back to in-person sessions, but today's session gives us the opportunity to have experts joining us from London and Washington and uh, to discuss this topic as we have a film uh, cycle, a film festival uh, focused on Qatar. So this is a session on political analysis and current affairs, uh, which will be complementary to those film sessions on Qatar. And now we'll start speaking English and moving from the language of Cervantes to the language of Shakespeare. Qatar, middle power, mediating state. Uh, despite its small size, then less than 12,000 12, uh, square kilometers, Qatar's geostrategic position has made this um, tiny state into a key player in the Gulf. Strong in economic terms, uh, Qatar is also vulnerable, uh, being one of the least populated countries in the region. After the Arab Spring, all the monarchies of the Gulf were forced to somehow rethink uh, their foreign policies, choosing to protect themselves from the winds of change that were blowing in the Middle East and North Africa. Doha took advantage of the situation to increase its presence and influence in the Arab regional arena by assuming a more active and, uh, let's say, independent role. This change from its traditional um, mediating role to an active one uh, also implied the expansion of the mm, soft power tools that had characterized its foreign action, uh, such as mediation in conflicts and uh, the international reach of the Al Jazeera chain, elements that have contributed to strengthening its international image and prestige. Uh, the modern state of Qatar, conceived as conceived by uh, uh, Amir Hamad bin Khalifa Athani in 1995, has led this small emirate to become a state with a global reputation, with diverse interests and investments, but also with powerful international allies, capable of exerting significant, significant regional influence and also of supplying a mediating platform for intricate com conflicts, such as uh, recently between the Taliban in Afghanistan and the uh, United States. To discuss these issues, we have a distinguished uh, panel on, of experts joining us uh, virtually. Uh, in London, uh, Neil Quilliam, he is an associate fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program, uh, Chatham House. He was previously senior research fellow heading the program's future dynamics in the Gulf project. He previously served as senior MENA energy advisor at the Foreign and Commonwealth Officer, senior MENA analyst at Control Risks London, and has also worked at the United Nations University in Amman. Neil has also uh, published a number of books and articles on international relations and political economy of Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and the uh, GCC states, the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, also in London, Andreas Krieg is a senior lecturer at the School of Security Studies at King's College London, uh, Royal College of Defense Studies, and fellow at the Institute of Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern Studies. He has spent more than 10 years living, studying, and working across the MENA region, first in the Levant and then in Qatar. Uh, in his research, Andreas looks at uh, violent non-state actors in the MENA region, 
and their uh, competition with state authority to provide com communal resilience. His research on the Gulf divide has led him to his current project looking at the internal and external weaponization of narratives in the Middle East. And in Washington, Emma Souvrier is a professor, professorial lecturer and a visiting scholar at the Institute for Middle East Studies at the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, where um, uh, her research focuses on US policy in the Gulf. Her class focuses on that. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and her research focuses on the security strategies and foreign policies of the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council, particularly the United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and the political economy of arms trade in the Gulf. Welcome to the three of you, and thank you very much for agreeing to take part to take part in this in this uh, panel uh, of uh, organized by Casa Arabe. So uh, let's tackle a first question. Uh, let's think of our of our audience that is in a way diverse and not everyone is as 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 well acquainted with 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 uh, Qatar and uh, let's start with an introduction what is it about about Qatar that has made it uh, a such a recurrent item in the in the headlines uh from its its sport uh, offensive uh, be it the Paris Saint-Germain uh, or or the World Cup to its very recent Taliban uh, US mediation. Th there seems to be somehow a, a grand design. Since when and, and why? Let's start with you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem. And thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I mean, there are lots of ways to sort of slice and dice this. Um, I'll just pick a couple of points in, in the few minutes that I have. I mean, of course, the thing that really put Qatar on, on, on the map is gas, is LNG, and the development of that natural resource since you know, 1995, 96, that has really elevated Qatar and put it in a, in a primary energy position. So that, that, that's my sort of opening point. Um, there are other sort of features. I mean, when one talks about a grand design, uh, we often think about governments having grand designs and having served in one, I can, I can assure most our audience that most governments don't really have a grand design or the capacity to put it into place. However, having said that, I mean, Qatar with its small population, as you've alluded to, and with its handful of key decision makers, they do actually have the luxury of you know, approaching policy or approaching, approaching strategy from a, a much less complicated manner in which much bigger countries where you have different institutions feeding into decision-making comes into. So there is the capacity and there is the ability for a smaller group of top decision-makers to, to plan. The other thing that really helps that design and implementation of design is this, this ability to make policy over the long term. We've just seen the elections that have taken place, of course, but decision makers are not you know, curtailed or not looking to a four year cycle. So their policies are you know, much more shaped to sort of fitting election cycles. And I think that has allowed the leadership from 95 up to 2013. And then we had the change, a, a succession that's taken place. It's allowed that leadership to take a sort of a longer term view of how it sees itself fitting within the international community and certainly in the region. Now, just before I finish, I mean, I, the decision making process is more simple than bigger states, but it doesn't mean it's not as challenging. Um, the region, as we know, is complicated and Qatar has had to sort of, you know, survive or even, I mean, you talked about sort of protecting itself from the winds of change, however you characterize that. I also see them has having shaped and influenced that too. So you've got, you've got this small state very well endowed with a natural resource, small population, handful of decision makers that have the luxury of you know, shaping policy over the over sort of a long time horizon. Um, I'll just sort of park it at that because I'm sure my colleagues will sort of pick up some of those points and take them further. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Neil. And yes, our, our next, uh, let's say, question would will be uh, focusing a bit more on the power structure and the decision decision making process. So let me just uh, ask Emma, what is it about Qatar that has made it a recurring item in the headlines? Thank you so much. And first, thank you again for this kind invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and to piggytail on, on what Neil was saying, uh, I would add that um, before the 1990s, as you know, Qatar was not particularly known as its own entity beyond uh, being one of the small thousand Gulf Arab states. And up, on, up until then, what I think is important to note is that the foreign and security policies of uh, this small emirate were largely aligned with its big Saudi neighbor, although there were some tensions, of course, between them, particularly in terms of border disputes. Uh, but nevertheless, Doha relied on its alliance with Riyadh uh, within the Gulf Cooperation Council and its indirect ties uh, with the United States as the regional protector to ensure its security and stability. And it did not seem uh, particularly eager to pursue any policy that diverged from Saudi Arabia. Uh, but then at the turn of the decade, uh, of the decade, several things changed that. First, the shock of the Kuwaiti invasion by the troops of Saddam Hussein that proved the relative inefficiency of the Ben bargaining strategy with Saudi Arabia. Um, added to tensions at the border with Saudi Arabia, uh, all of which pushed Qatar to establish its very own strategy, uh, one, one aspect of which being that it relied on direct ties with external powers, the United States, of course, but also France that had already been um, one of its main, if not the main arms supplier uh, to the, the small Emirates for several decades before 1990. Um, so it, it, uh, what, what happened, and I apologize for the external noise if you can hear it, uh, what, what happened is that the Qatar, Qatar started to differentiate itself from the Saudi stance and started trying to get out of the shadow of its big neighbor. The second thing that happened, and Neil uh, alluded to it, is uh, that it had everything to do with the arrival of Hamad bin Khalifa in power uh, and his acting on actually on, on a number of factors. But one of these factors was a very personal determination uh, to, to put Qatar on the map. Um, and actually, when you go to Qatar and ask about why is it that Qatar is so hyperactive uh, to, to put itself on the map. Uh, a couple of people talk to you about, you know, personal history of Hamad bin Khalifa and, and tie this, this want to, this will to put Qatar on the map to a youth frustration. Uh, apparently when, when the Emir was, uh, the previous Emir, Hamad bin Khalifa, was young, he went to the UK actually, and, uh, and someone at the airport uh, said that they had never heard of a country named Qatar. And so that, that, might be, that might be a legend, but this is a story that is often told to explain why uh, the Qatari Emir was so uh, adamant that his, his country should be put on the map. Um, so he made it his, his mission to change that, and that was the start of what you described, the soft power strategy, rely, uh, relying on Al Jazeera and building its role as a mediator and being friends with everyone. So this answered a survival dilemma uh, that was aimed at visibility and legitimacy on the regional and global stage, but it also answered a vision and an ambition that was very linked to the personality of Hamad bin Khalifa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. So um, uh, going uh, to our, our third speaker, uh, uh, Andreas, uh, why do you think this uh, small state has, has uh, somehow such a large presence in the current uh, affairs and uh, the headlines it generates? <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you as well for having me. I completely agree with what Neil and Emma already said, which leaves very little for me to add. Um, so it is, it is obviously a small state wedged between two major powers, two powers, regional superpowers, Saudi and, and Iran, in, a, in, a, in an environment and context that is inherently insecure. So there is an insecurity complex there, uh, whereby as a small state, you really only have two avenues. One is the, the one that Emma already uh, uh, described, the one of bandwagoning. And the other one is kind of forging your own independent foreign and security policy, but only doing that by kind of, um, you know, hedging your bets, engaging with state and non-state actors and building networks that kind of support whatever you want to do. And that kind of gives you freedom to maneuver. And, you know, as Neil already said, you know, Qatar has an immense wealth. It is one of the richest countries in the world. And they found they were looking for ways to translate that financial power and wealth into foreign and security policy power. How do you translate financial power into, into foreign policy or foreign power or, or even security power? How do you project that? And I think the countries have found a way to do this. In the 21st century, information environment uh, allows this to happen. And we're in an, in an environment where you know, delegation to state, non-state actors, to media outlets, to a range of different surrogates allows you to build networks across a, a variety of different domains. So Qatar is obviously not just very, very present in the LNG and gas uh, domain. They're also very present in the media domain through Al Jazeera and a variety of different outlets. But they're also very much present in the security and foreign policy of the wider Arab world or the MENA region uh, through a variety of different networks that the countries have built over the years. And I think the way for them, you know, because as Neil already said, they have they have a luxury of being able to first of all, have a lot of financial wealth. And on the other hand, having a very homogenous domestic society. That means there are very few fault lines. The countries don't have the same security paranoias that the Saudis have, that the Emiratis have, uh, that other Gulf states have. And that gave them the freedom to experiment. And I think we've seen that during the Arab Spring, which is kind of an, a, you know, the, th the three, four years between 2011 and 2014 was somewhat the years where the countries were experimenting to actually no longer play the role of a mediator, but actually becoming a, a, a power that takes sides. And that was kind of historically an anomaly if you look at the history of Qatar, because uh, you know, the countries learned their lesson saying, okay, taking sides is not gonna help us for, as a small state. And uh, the lesson learned is we need to go back to the future to uh, you know, engaging uh, through moderation, through mediation and um, through building networks, because that kind of serves us better in building sustainable relationships that we can then draw upon and buy credit and capital in, um, in the West. And I think that's very important uh, for the countries. They try to find a way to make themselves relevant as a broker, as a partner for Western allies. Um, uh, most importantly, the United States, by far the United States, the most important one, and then afterwards European partners as well. And I think that was their primary focus and they haven't really deviated from that. Uh, unlike other Gulf states, the countries have been very firmly in the Western uh, camp and they've put all their eggs in the Western and American basket and they will continue to do that. Excellent, thank you very much for this first first answer that I think sets quite quite well without really going back into into uh, uh, the, the let's say the history of of how our states formed in the in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, but it it sets it sets the tone in a way for the the, the next question, uh, which is about the power structure of of the of the Emirate. How are decisions taken uh, been taken that uh, have made it made the, uh, Qatar so different from its neighbors? I mean, you have more or less pointed. To, um, to the fact that there is a, uh, a handful of decision makers uh, that also they have the means to do it. Uh, there was also mention to the personal style of the uh, Amir Hamad bin Khalifa, uh, who abdicated in 2013 to give way to one of his sons, his successor, uh, Tamim bin Hamad. Uh, uh, so if we if we concentrate on this uh, on this uh, let's say dimension for the the second segment of, of our session. Uh, Emma, what would, would you say uh, is uh, makes this power structure so um, characteristic? And how does Hamad uh, differ, differ from his son, Tamim? Thank you. Um, yeah, as um, I mean, as, as you've just mentioned, and as I was uh, mentioning earlier, much of the state branding and the visibility and legitimacy strategy of Qatar starting in the in the 90s uh, 
can be directly attributed to the emir. So he was not alone in the decision-making processes. Uh, as I think uh, Neil mentioned, there was a small circle of close family and friends pitching in around the emir, but uh, he was the ultimate decision maker. And uh, I think it's important to say about uh, Qatar, Qatar has technically been a constitutional monarchy. Um, so there's a consultative, consultative uh, assembly, but the emir has the power to approve or reject uh, leg legislations. Um, and the emir appoints uh, his, his own uh, prime minister, for instance. So something worth mentioning, I think it's part, um, is um, as part of uh, Hamad bin Khalifa's getting a hold on power in the 90s, uh, relied on his rearranging of power networks around him to put his close circle in charge of important bodies and, and you know, um, um, uh, companies, etc. All of this, in fact, is not very different from what we have seen in the UAE uh, with Mohammed bin Zayed or in Saudi Arabia with Mohammed bin Salman, though. So I, I would say that the difference lies in uh, the parameters of the strategy that they developed, uh, particularly if you look at what strategy Qatar developed and what strategy the UAE developed. The other thing uh, that we can say is that in the Gulf region, as in many others, uh, leaders are perhaps first and foremost uh, preoccupied with their own political survival. Uh, so we talk of you know, regime security as a primary factor in shaping foreign and defense policies. And I thought that it was interesting uh, that you mentioned in the introduction that, you know, Qatar is vulnerable uh, being one of the least uh, populated countries in the region, because this is true, of course, in a way, because this small population, uh, you know, cannot protect the country, for instance. But I would also say, as, as Andreas uh, was, was mentioning, that it has been an asset uh, for Qatar in the way Qatar has been different from its neighbor is that because it has such a small population and such enormous wealth, the regime has little to uh, nothing really to fear from its, its uh, own population. And, and that gave uh, the regime much more leeway to organize their strategy the way they wanted. Um, so that's, that's really the, the main difference that I, that I would see. As for your question about the differences with Tamim, I would actually argue that there has been more continuity than rupture. And, um, you know, when Tamim bin, uh, bin Hamad succeeded in his father in 2013, he praised him for transforming Qatar from a state that some could barely locate on a map uh, into a major player, um, you know, of a major regional and global player. Uh, and he has largely continued his father's policy coming, coming back to mediation and visibility and being friends with everyone as the, and we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to that, but he's coming back to that as the page of the Arab Spring has uh, resol resolutely turned. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Andreas, so do you think that Tamim is just uh, following the continuity line of, of, his, uh, of his father, uh, or do you see any differences? Uh, maybe he's grown into the role more, or how do you react to this uh, question? No, I, I think it actually has changed quite dramatically from, from Hamad bin Khalifa. Um, in, in, a, in a variety of different ways. Um, so obviously Hamad bin Khalifa very much is the father of the modern of modern Qatar, establishing the institutions and the networks that make Qatar what it is today. Um, but when Tamim came into power, you know, the narrative domestically as well in the region was, oh, here's the son coming, just following on from the father, and the father is kind of this omni, um, uh, omnipresent uh, actor behind the throne that still pulls the string, uh, and, and that is absolutely not the truth. Um, if you look at Decision making in Qatar it has always been more consensual than in other countries, because it is a very small community. Three hundred thousand uh, people, you know, three hundred thousand indigenous countries means that uh, statecraft and any any local affair is essentially a family affair. You go to the tribal leader and you kind of solve issues uh, face to face in a in a form that you know if uh, there's this old myth of 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 um, of a desert democracy where democracy is direct, where relationships and access to the emir is direct. 
And that was certainly true for most of the Arab Gulf states, but I think in Qatar, because of the size, it is actually still fairly true for indigenous countries. Um, and you know that is that makes the decision making a lot more um, consensual. Uh, problems usually are being solved before they hit the fan, before they actually go public. Um, and this way, you know, it is a very very stable environment because you can kind of directly engage. Uh, and obviously, every emir has to has to maneuver that sort of uh, game, and they've they've been able to do that fairly fairly uh, fairly well. There is something that um, Emma said already about um, Hamad bin Khalifa. Hamad bin Khalifa created a, a, a nexus of people around him that were personal friends, um, that were you know, uh, given quite a lot of leeway to do what they thought was necessary to achieve uh, um, what they wanted to achieve. And some of them were larger than life figures like Hamad bin Jawsim, the prime minister and foreign minister who had a very, 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 very strong input on uh, decision-making. Um, and the other one was Ahmad bin Ali, who was the defense minister at the time under Ahmad bin uh, Khalifa. And all of them had quite a lot of power in their own right and had almost blanco checks to do what they thought was necessary. I think under Tamim, we're seeing a change towards a more meritocratic system, uh, whereby the people who were appointed or are appointed are not these larger than life figures. These are people who are very loyal, obviously, to the Emir, to the central inner circle in, round, in the D1. Um, but it's based on how, what people can actually deliver. And, and, and also in terms of experience, and technocr technocratic um, uh, uh, knowledge as well. So we have a lot more of a technocratic um, uh, uh, policy-oriented uh, selection process when it comes to people who, who make decisions on the strategic level. That applies to ministers, but also to people underneath. And I think that has changed very dramatically how Qatar is faring also in terms of strategy making and policy making. The Qatar has become immensely more successful um, in, in the last um, eight years than it has uh, in, in, in previous era during Hamad bin Khalifa. A lot more, like I said, are oriented towards outcome rather than keeping certain people happy. And also obviously Qatar doesn't have the same complex um, you know, fears and phobias about regime security. Qatar doesn't have to really worry that much about any internal rifts or breakaway uh, secessionist elements in the country that every other single uh, Euro uh, Gulf state has to somewhat deal with. Uh, I think Qatar in that way is a very, very resilient country. And that makes governance so much more easy because A, you have that consensual domestic element where you directly engage with the people you want to engage with and you have that direct rapport. And also in terms of a foreign and security policy, you have, a, you have a lot more leeway and freedom to do and design strategy and policy as you see fit and potentially experimenting with it. And the way that Tamim actually has cut, very, very clearly cut, uh, there was a very clear cut in 2013, 2014 in foreign and security policy. After Hamad bin Jassim was left, um, after Hamad, uh, um, uh, um, Hamad bin Ali was left as a defense minister, uh, left basically, um, you, you saw that Qatar went back to pre-Arab spring very much disengaging from Syria, disengaging from Libya, disengaging from many of the adventures that Qatar was involved in during the Arab Spring. And that is a, is a very clear sign that the countries learned the lesson and that Tamim was also trying to make a clear cut from the policies of his father. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, finally, to, to you, Neil, I mean, if, if, uh, if this is uh, uh, somehow a, has evolved into a more meritocratic a uh, system or evolved from from the um, from the current emir uh, and has distanced somehow from from his uh, uh, from his father um do you i mean where does the uh, let's say the um where does this leave the athani clan or does it work differently from any others like uh, both emma and uh, andreas uh, have pointed out do, do they stand out the Althanis as operating differently? I mean, obviously the Althani are the principal family and that that isn't about to change. I mean, I think they're, but, but, but I think what, you know, what, what's probably happening. I mean, when I first started looking at Qatar and I started visiting and you know, I was always told, you just, you've just got to think about five or six people at absolutely maximum at the top. Those are the people who are, you know, making the decisions, no point talking to anybody else. Um, but I think as Andreas has sort of, you know, mapped out the sort of institutional capacity has, has developed in the country, there, there has been this kind of shift towards, a, you know, a technocratic elite, if you like. I mean, so they are, they are next generation and they've come through. So, so you've, you've got more of a depth, I would say, throughout the different institutions. 
they they are principally drawn from you know the key families. The same sets of names are going to keep keep appearing, but but given that um, you know the population is only three hundred thousand, as 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 both Emma and Andreas have said, you know I mean it's it's basically a family affair. So so there's there's not going to be a lot of deviation um, in in and around that. But but what I what I think is I mean there are two 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 points I'd like to make one one I think is is quite remarkable was this you know shift in 2013 the succession was you know was was very carefully managed choreographed and very very smooth and Hamad bin Jassim you know I mean who who could have thought prior to that 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 he would have just you know stepped down and just handed over the keys um, he'd also been you know a a key architect of of, of the Qatari state um, who could have imagined he would have been willing to do that. And myself at the time, I just thought, OK, he might be handing back the keys, but I'm sure he's got a spare set in his back pocket and uh, he's going to want to do things. But, but you know, uh, Amir Hamad and him really did step back. And I think, I think that that was that critical moment in Qatar's history where those lessons had been learned. Qatar had, had, had been the sort of darling of the West for some time. It was, you know, it, it was emerging. It, it became toxic. From that kind of 2013 14 period and really really kind of got burnt and i think it was almost as though you know don't want to use too many um <laughs> characterizations here but it was almost like a little phoenix you know sort of it went into the fire and it came back and and it's changed and and, and it's shifting and it, and its focus is now um a little you know a little bit different it's a much, it's a much softer kind of um, Qatar than, than was possibly before. It was much more kind of assertive and aggressive. And then, and then sort of finally, one thing I'd, I'd like to say sort of about those decision makers. I remember the first time I went to Qatar Foundation um, and I went up onto the top of the building and you know, my sort of inter interlocutors almost described how they saw the country and where they sort of see, saw this country fitting into the international community and sort of into the region. And I just thought, wow, you know, isn't that amazing? Um, these these guys are in such an advantageous position. You know, financially, small population, decision making wise, they can really chart the path that they want. They can go down a bad path, or they can go, go down a good path. But they actually have this. You know, they're in the driving seat, taking them where where they're going. And and that that I think that was in about 2015. And I've really sort of seen the you know seen the country kind of develop and push push in in this in this new direction that Andreas. Uh, mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, moving to our third segment, um, some analysts argue that um, regional blocks in the MENA region uh, haven't really uh, stood the test of time. Examples such as the Union of the Arab Maghreb or even the Arab League spring to mind. But the Gulf Cooperation Council had seemed to be let's say, efficient and united until the 2017 crisis, or at least that was the perception. Um, this crisis left uh, Qatar particularly uh, isolated. So what, what happened during the Gulf divide and how did uh, Doha respond? Andreas first. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> that was a yeah, for me, the Gulf divide obviously goes back to the Arabs, early days of the Arab Spring. This divide is, didn't start in 2017. It is a divide fundamentally from, you know, from my point of view, it's fundamentally an ideological, ontological uh, divide over how to manage the fallout of the Arab Spring, how to actually rebuild the region and the uh, regional order after the Arab Spring uh, as the old powerhouses somewhat disintegrated. And Qatar on one hand and the UAE on the other uh, very much had and still have diametrically opposed views on how to do that. Uh, and so the, the, the question is how, how was that, you know, in, in 2011, both Qatar and the UAE engaged in Libya together. Uh, it's some sort of cooperation and very quickly, both sides ended up supporting different people in Libya. And Libya somewhat became a microcosm for the sort of divisions that we then later saw uh, emerging across the entire Arab world. And Qatar being on one end together with Turkey and, and the UAE and then later with Saudi Arabia, they were on the other side of that. Um, and that kind of culminated in the first Gulf crisis in 2014, uh, where you know the, the neighboring countries withdrew their ambassadors. And then in 2017, the blockade against Qatar, which was a real escalation of, of, of simmering tensions in, in the Gulf. Um, how did the countries um, manage that? I think they managed it 
surprisingly well, considering how much pressure they were under in 2017. So, and also why I'm saying surprisingly well is, is considering in, in what kind of position of strength the neighbors were, uh, especially the UAE. For me, this is an UAE instigated rift. Um, the UAE were absolutely vehemently, and they still are vehemently opposed to the view that Qatar has, had been propagated during the Arab Spring. Uh, Qatar wanted to seize the opportunity of rebuilding the Arab world uh, based on a more pluralistic approach, saying, you know, democracy, yes, although not in a necessarily in a liberal uh, manner, but one that, you know, definitely fosters civil society, supports civil society, allows freedom of speech, um, and empowers actors, regardless of whether they were secular or, or Islamist. Uh, and that was a key problem for the UAE, who are vehemently opposed civil society and, 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 and free liberal civil society because they see it as a threat to regime security. Again, the Qataris never had that problem because they, they knew how to manage that. Um, as they, you know, as we already outlined, the Qataris don't have these sort of fault lines. They never had to really worry about uh, regime security. The Emiratis, on the other hand, couldn't really experiment as freely as the Qataris. And then we have two leaders who are entirely different in terms of approaching that issue. On the one hand, you have Tamim, um, who is a lot more of a transformational leader, more consensual. On the other hand, you have MBZ, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed uh, of, of Abu Dhabi, who is a transactional leadership, uh, shows transactional leadership, very much zero sum in, its, in his approach. And these two visions, these two men, and, uh, and these two countries going head to head uh, with one another. And I think that kind of broke a, an organization, the GCC, which I think was already breaking apart on its fringes anyway. Um, it depends on what your what your um, what your point of reference is. If you compare the GCC to the Arab League, then obviously the GCC had more deepening and more widening than than the Arab League, um, and a lot more readiness by the nation states to actually surrender some of their sovereignty. But if you compare it to the EU, for example, uh, and, and and other projects outside the region, then the GCC is a failure um, because in the end of the day, these are young nation states that are very nationalistic. For, that, for whom nationalism is a very important element of, of development and building, um, um, you know, building, building states, building statehood, building nationhood, um, and for whom the GCC and, uh, meant surrendering some of that national pride as well as national sovereignty. And that's something that none of the Gulf states really want to do. So they always had to find a compromise that everyone was happy with. And that was a kind of agreeing on the least common denominator. And that was uh, a very problematic, as in, as we've seen on occasion, on, on, on multiple occasions. And I think where we stand today is that the GCC is far from being repaired. I think the, the GCC is an organization that will uh, function on some issues fairly well, particularly on low politics. But I think on high politics, we will see a continuation of nations uh, and, and GCC states doing their own thing based on their own national parameters and uh, national uh, strategies. And uh, I think despite all the reconciliation narrative that is going on everywhere at the moment, I think we're very, very far away from a real true reconciliation because the, the ideological divides that I was outlining before about where we go with the Arab world in the future is still there. And ideological divides are not some that you can negotiate over. And I think that is, uh, that, that's why we will see more tension, even if they're not necessarily culminating in the Gulf, they might, uh, they might exist on the fringe and fringes of of the Arab world. Thank you, uh, Andreas. Uh, Neil, uh, over to you. I mean, what do you think this Gulf, this this Gulf divide uh, has, uh, or in which in which state has it left uh, uh, Doha? So I, I, I mean, I think Doha has 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 actually emerged in a in a very strong position. I think. Um, I mean, it's you know it it weathered the storm of of of, of you know of the blockade. It you know it it played with a with a straight back bat. You know it went down the legal channels. It went down the legal avenues. It diversified its relationships quite you know quite quite firmly. Um, it certainly cultivated and developed you know relationships. Um, through South America, it's got it's got a strong relationship with Brazil. I mean, you find a lot of Brazilians now in, in, in Qatar, for, for example. Um, so it it really played. I mean, I think it played its hands very carefully, very deftly. Um, it it understood and appreciated that you know the key relationship was with the U.S. was with Washington. There was some fear, I think, in the you know in the early stages. 
um, that I mean, I'm, I'm sure Emma could talk about that in more detail. But there was there was fear that you know Washington, particularly under the Trump administration, might come out you know in some form of opposition to Doha and and fully back uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, bearing in mind Trump's visit was you know to Riyadh with that orb and and, and Sisi, you know there was a clear indication that the relationship was there. Um, so I actually think Doha has come out, and we can probably talk about this later. But I mean, to a position where now it's you know it's playing this instrumental role in um, managing you know the Taliban and the U.S. and playing this very important sort of role as mediator. One other thing I'd just like to add, though, to what Andreas was saying, and um, I think it was about two very different visions for the region between Mohammed bin Zayed um, and Tamim. But there was, you know, there was another very important player in this, and I think MBZ saw, you know, in its very large neighbor in Saudi Arabia, he saw in, in sort of in Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, I think that he saw a sort of a young, impressionable um, man who's waiting to sort of take power, um, that he could more or less kind of pull on side. I mean, there had been some, you know, traditional antagonism between Qatar and Saudi. Anyway, we've, we've already heard about that. But I think in a way, MBZ sort of saw, you know, this, this young prince next door that he could, you know, pull into this vision. He could pull him aside and say, you know, you've got a major problem inside your country. You need to tackle political Islam. Our vision for the region, my vision should be your vision for the region. And we need to look at what happened in the Arab Spring. And we need to build strong alliances. We need strong um, states with strong, strong leaders, that are socially liberal. We've seen the changes taking place in Saudi Arabia and that pursue a secular policy. Secular in Saudi Arabia doesn't seem to fit very well, but I think that's probably how they would characterize their policy. And you could see you know, this, this alliance of strong secular policy states emerging. Um, Andreas has heard me say this many times before, so forgive me. So you, know, so you, you had, you would, you, you had um, you know, UAE, Saudi Arabia was gonna fit into that. Egypt was part of that. There was a plan for Libya with, with Haftar, um, even sort of reaching out at some point, and we can begin to see the beginnings of that in Syria um, and Israel as well, sort of fitting into that picture. So you had two very different visions for the region between Qatar and, um, and the UAE, and Saudi Arabia for some time was really kind of pulled into that. Um, and I think MBS signed up to that. That relationship has, has now soured. Um, for a host of reasons. And since that has soured, you know, we've certainly seen Saudi Arabia moving closer and closer towards Doha. And it was, it was Riyadh that, that played the principal role in sort of ending, you know, the blockade. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Neil. Um, so Emma, I mean, it seems that this GCC um, uh, efficiency was somehow uh, deeply scarred by this uh, Gulf divide. Uh, also, we have from both Andreas and Neil established that it's extremely um, related to the Arab Spring ideological divide. I mean, so much so that even Egypt was there, although it's a non-GCC country, uh, there meaning, you know, inciting with uh, the, with the with the Emirates and the Saudis against Qatar. So, what what do you sort of like? What's the your impression of how um, Qatar emerged out of this? Thank you. Um, I I really liked uh, both of uh, Andreas and Neil's answers, and I concur with a lot that has been said already. In particular, I liked uh, in in terms of you know how Qatar reacted. Uh, I really like the expression that Doha played with a straight bat. Uh, it, indeed, it really kept its line and made sure that it secured its traditional relationships with a lot of uh, diplomatic visits to offer its narrative, uh, its narrative to its partners, you know, as a reasonable actor that was bullied by its two neighbors and um, and I think that was particularly important, as uh, as as Neil mentioned, in in a context where uh, President Trump uh, and his his visit, you know, to Riyadh and was was kind of perceived uh, apparently by Riyadh and Abu Dhabi as a carte blanche to isolate Qatar. Uh, so so Doha really 
you know, through uh, a lot of diplomatic visits and and uh, and and uh, sending letters, etc., made sure that its narrative uh, was heard in uh, in the main capitals. Um, it did something else, which is uh, that Doha really oiled the kegs of its relationships with its traditional partners uh, through a lot of arms deals. Uh, we came back to a very, you know, um, a, a very um, Gulf arms trade 101 in the political dimension of arms trade, I would say. And then it also added a special relationship with Ankara, which I uh, with which I'm sure we'll we'll talk about more. And I would I would add also that it refocused most of its efforts on national cohesion because that was potentially one of the risks uh, with the crisis was to indeed um, turn Qatari population, however small, against a leader that that had uh, that that could not protect them against such a situation. And uh, I would actually say that the Gulf crisis uh, for all the, 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 the damage that it did, uh, did also a lot to consolidate uh, national unity and in the establishment of Tamim as a strong and reliable leader in Qatar. Uh, when really probably, you know, the neighbors probably wished that uh, they could take advantage of the fact that there was a new and, and young Emir. To go to your question about the GCC, um, the reason why uh, I would argue that it precisely did not break uh, is that it has actually been always very flexible. But a less consensual way to say this is that the reason why the GCC stood the test of time, as you were mentioning, is because it did not set out to achieve anything major as a regional entity. Uh, the fact that it did not intervene during the, seven, the, the 2017 Gulf crisis is very telling. It continued functioning as a body that is more about making declarations than about uh, taking concrete actions. And this has been the case since the very beginning. And here I think of Matteo Legrenzi. And Matteo explains this very well. He says that the main achievement, which is a lot of the regional entity, is to have contributed to forming a Haliji identity that is really distinct from the rest of the Middle East. So the GCC can best be seen as a very loose association that is not particularly effective, but did create a specific identity. And that's what we saw, uh, including with the crisis. And um, one other important point, I think, is that the 2017 Gulf crisis can be seen as, um, as a failed attempt by Saudi Arabia and the UAE to bully Qatar into adopting their line, even though their line is, in fact, not always exactly the same uh, between them two, uh, as was illustrated in Yemen, for instance. Um, and I would say that the apparent or the official resolution of the crisis today can actually be interpreted as the confirmation of a new multipolarization of the Gulf. Uh, when we talk about the multipolarity of the Gulf and Gulf security, we usually talk about, you know, the multiplicity of external actors that are involved in Gulf security and in the region. But I think another dimension of this multipolarization of the of Gulf international relations is to see the rise of all the other poles uh, within the Gulf region, in addition to the traditional triangle of power, you know, what Andres was, uh, was mentioning earlier, he was talking about the the regional superpowers of Iran and Saudi Arabia. You, you can also add Iraq. I mean, historically, you could add Iraq. And, and then what we saw since 2011 against the backdrop of the Arab Spring and all of the proactive policies of Qatar and the UAE, and in addition to Saudi Arabia, is to really have Qatar and the UAE emerge as new poles in the, in the Gulf, uh, in, in, in the in Gulf international relations as, as actors that you that have a very specific uh, approach to the region, a very specific strategy, and can really be identified as their own pole and not just a, a, a Saudi ben, you know, bandwagon to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for, for complementing with your, with, your, with your insights. I, fi I find the concept of a Khaliji identity or a Gulf identity um, uh, quite, quite interesting, one that has not really been as analyzed or as, or as often mentioned. Uh, and it, it could explain uh, also some, you know, some kind of cohesion in, in the region. And also that, that somehow contrasts with this multipolarization of the Gulf that you were talking about. That is also, I uh, think in terms of international relations and the balance of power in the region, quite interesting to, to observe, uh, observe and, 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 and sort of like pinpoint. Um, I kind of think that this um, GCC uh, or the Gulf divide has uh, left a, a scar in the region. But then again, scars do tell us a lot of, you know, of, of, of um, stories or of, uh, of where uh, uh, someone has been. Uh, they, give us, they give us also insights, uh, scars of, of, of the, uh, the region, or just like a, per a person would have a scar that would tell us something more about him or her. So going back to the, mm, uh, or carrying on, uh, with the international relations of the region, uh, and specifically how uh, Qatar uh, dealt with that Gulf divide. Uh, you, uh, um, Emma, you were just mentioning uh, Ankara and how it strengthened somehow the ties of Qatar and Turkey. Uh, um, uh, Andres was also mentioning uh, uh, the uh, um, relation with, uh, with Washington, with the US. Um, so, uh, if we uh, try and analyze also that um, result of uh, emerging after 2017, uh, how was Doha dealing with Ankara, with Washington, and how was it looking for also new alliances in in other? I mean, you mentioned the arm the arms deals and uh, with with uh, with the traditional partners maybe such as France, but where does it stand with Brussels, with Beijing, with Moscow? Uh, you want to start, Neil, Quilliam? Sure, sure. Um, if I can, if I can um, I, I, I'll talk to Washington and Ankara a little bit. But, it, but before I do that, if I can just make one point I should have made earlier, and perhaps the three of us should have made it, um, was that when, when we think about you know, the, the resolution or Alula, uh, Emma just reminded me, I mean, there were what 13 demands made of Qatar, you know, th throughout the um, th throughout that period. I don't think any of them were really fulfilled. Um, so, I, so I think you know, when Alula came about, I mean, very little had actually been achieved by the other four states. So I think I think that's just a point I just wanted to to make. Can, can you just explain for our audience what does Alula stand for? What it is? Sure. Sorry. Yes. That that was. Um, Back in January, um, when this, this, the, the, all six Gulf states actually came together, and it sort of it, it brought it brought an end to this this kind of blockade period of the force of the of the Gulf states and certainly of Egypt as well. And it was like the formal closing of it. It wasn't a particularly detailed document, but it but it was a it. It, it was a sort of a mild um, acceptance that things could could move on and and shift forward. So it drew you know it drew things to a close. There wasn't anything specific or detailed. There was no well we you know we we uh, Qatar met these five or six demands and we didn't reach goals on the others. So it was a kind of I guess kind of a draw, draw, drawing the period to a close and saying let's move on. Um, that that that's essentially how I how I would characterize it. Um, to your question, certainly, you know, certainly with um, Washington, uh, I, I, as a small state anyway, in a, in a region where, you know, th there is a lot of conflict and there is intense competition, um, one naturally has to build alliances and one has to be able to sort of project power, you know, th through doing that. And of course, um, the US, as, as, as we heard, has been, you know, a key and instrumental player. For um, for Qatar, so it was absolutely critical that 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 relationship um, received a lot of attention and and, and was managed. And, and as we've all sort of said a little bit, there was some concern in the early days because the Trump administration seemed to show some kind of partiality 
um, in in the situation. But I think um, that that relationship was 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 worked really well. But the but but the Qataris really did have a challenge on their hands in DC, in that specifically, you know, the Emiratis with their long a long serving ambassador Yusuf Al Taber, um, probably has one of the best ruler decks in in DC. Has you know an amazingly established network and has managed to sort of you know elevate himself and elevate the the Emirates certainly in the minds of um, a lot of uh, policymakers decision makers. And portrayed, you know, um, the UAE as this modern, secular, open, liberal, socially liberal state, and one that the US should really be working with and sort of, uh, you know, being being a principal ally. So really, the the, the Qataris really had to sort of, really had to step up and and deepen and and, and push push on their engagement. Um, I think it was probably, a, I mean, that was a that was that was. A train in in motion. Um, I'm sure in the initial stages it was quite hard to do, and uh, I did meet with quite a few Qatari officials in DC who were who were sort of really quite concerned about the way things were were, were shaping up. But anyway, time you know time is a is a great healer, and uh, allowed I think the Qataris to really kind of uh, work their you know diplomatic magic, and I, and you would hear these stories at the time, you know that Al Udaid Air Base, which is you know, a massive air base that the that, that US has, and uh, Emma can talk about that in more detail, of course, um, you know, is going to be packed up or closed up, which is, you know, I mean, to, to anybody with a little bit of knowledge would know that's that's just nonsense and that that, that couldn't happen. Um, or it would have to be a huge operation to do so. Um, but I think once once they got through the little sort of uh, wobbles, I think things were things were sort of fairly, fairly on course because of the way they played it. Naturally, the relationship with Turkey strengthened and deepened and you know Turkey um, sort of prepositioned 6,000 troops in, in, in Qatar um, more symbolic than than anything else but it did bring those did bring Ankara and Doha much much closer they're more closely aligned in how they and how they see the vision um, certainly Doha was extremely supportive financially of uh, of Ankara, particularly as it was going through some of its woes and having some of its own problems, but at the same time, Qatar was quite 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 clear on saying this is a very important relationship. It's not a strategic necessarily a deep strategic relationship, um, and it's not one that you know we're willing to um, well we're certainly not willing to sacrifice it. But it doesn't mean we can't operate and cooperate with other states in the region. So there, there's this sort of I guess I, I would call it from the post 2013 period onwards, a sort of maturation and maturity of policy making coming through. Um, and, and I think that that has sort of stood it in very good stead, both in Ankara um, and in DC. And, and to the extent that, you know, we, we talk about, or I would talk, I talk about, you know, the sort of the Qatari brand becoming toxic because of the, um, because of the Arab Spring and it's come out on this other side. Now Qatar is now change of administration in, in, in the US and the UAE is now facing its own set of problems and issues. Um, I would say it was probably a good five or six years behind Qatar in that kind of curve and in that kind of space. But alliance building, absolutely critical if you're a small state, really helps if you're a highly you know, resource endowed state um, that certainly wants to work closely with Western powers. Mm -hmm. So Emma has 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 thank you Neil has has uh, Qatar played its its cards well in terms of alliance building. Uh, and you focus a lot on on Washington Doha relations, but you also mentioned Ankara. Uh, is it fairly balanced in terms of how it has played its cards? Thank you. Um, before I uh, thank you for this question, um, I wanted to go back to, um, I'm not sure that, that it, I made it clear in my previous answer about, I do think that the 2017 uh, Gulf crisis has scarred the region. What I would say is that it scarred the region at a human level, um, much more than at an institutional level, 
which is why my previous answer was really on the institution of the GCC that I don't see as broken because it is so flexible. But I do think that it's going to take a long while for the population to, to get past uh, this, this crisis. And I think that's where the scars of this crisis are, are going to be the, the most uh, important to, to follow, actually. Um, yes, maybe one has to explain, Emma, why these populations were scarred. I mean, there are relations between, uh, let's say, just civil society uh, that go back and forth, that drive back and forth from one country to the other. Exactly. A lot of, uh, well, it, it, it actually goes a little bit to my point about the Khadiji identity, even though a lot of people in the Gulf see themselves as uh, Qatari or Emirati, there is a sense of a connection within the Khadij, this Khadiji identity. You have a lot of people who live in a country but work in another you have in in intra uh, national uh, family ties etc and this crisis really affected uh people at a human level that could not go and see their families that had to quit their job and go back to uh, their original uh, their country of origin and so this really put a dent in that that Khaliji identity that the gcc had contributed to uh, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's really where I see uh, perhaps the most important scars that this crisis will have left in the in the region. Um, now, uh, going back to the the uh, the idea of you know seeking alliances and partnerships with large actors, uh, I think as I mentioned at the very beginning, it has actually been always the case, and as Neil was saying is it's very uh, coherent as a small state to seek alliances with, with larger states. Um, what I will say is that it's actually, um, it's interesting and, and, uh, and Andreas was, was talking also about this opposition between Qatar on one side and, and the UAE on the other side and, and how different the strategies have been actually since the 1990s, I would argue. Um, and this, the the where, where you see a difference between those two small uh, Gulf states is that for Qatar uh, since the 1990s you've seen an almost complete delegation of hard power. The hard power dimension has been almost completely delegated to the United States, um, as opposed to uh, other actors such as the UAE that look to develop more credible armed forces, but also use this diversification of partnership and weapons supplier uh, as a means to achieve a relative autonomy. So you really have a difference between the way they play their cards in terms of, of having partnerships with, with bigger power um, or, or you know, uh, global powers. And to go to more recently, your point about uh, Turkey uh, and and the United States, I I would not put uh, these two on the same level. Obviously, I, as I just said, and as Neil said, I mean Qatar today is uh, is still relies mostly, if not entirely, on the United States uh, for its security. So Turkey jumping in uh, was. I think actually the, the most important point in what happened with, with Turkey jumping in was uh, that to me it illustrated a regionalization of what I call the prince state rivalry between Qatar and the UAE. What we saw then was we saw a situation that had been going on for a while of Qatar versus the UAE that really con that consolidated against the backdrop of the Arab Spring. And in 2014, but especially in 2017, with Egypt being part of the quartet, what we've seen is a situation of Qatar slash Turkey versus UAE slash Egypt. And that is really the main point to me of what happened is that you had a consolidation of this regionalization of the opposition of these two uh, of these two uh, small neighbors that Qatar and the UAE are and that really um, that, that that really articulate at least some of their strategy 
in opposition to the other, uh, you know, along the Gnosticism of the small difference and really proving how different they are from their neighbor. Um, this being said, obviously, there's clearly a multipolarization of Gulf security, as you mentioned, uh, with Russia and China being increasingly present in the region as a whole. Uh, but all of this, I, I would not actually tie all of this to uh, the GCC or the Gulf crisis. I think it's, it's rather about an evolving security perception on the part of Qatar. And, and for sure, and I'll finish with this, uh, Neil alluded to that, but um, I think in Washington, it has been extremely interesting to see, you know, when, when the, 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 the severance of, of ties uh, between the Quartet and, and Qatar were first announced, uh, Trump first jumped in and said, congratulations, that's great, uh, before some of his advisors had to jump in and say, oh, well, no, like, we can't actually, uh, we can't actually agree with the Quartet right now. I mean, just let's, let's remind ourselves that we have one of our biggest base in the region, based in Qatar. So maybe we should, you know, reconsider this uh, this enthusiasm about the the Gulf crisis. So that's all I have to say about this. Thank you, thank you very much, Emma. And uh, indeed, the, the the Trump administration, I think, was was full of uh, of surprises for 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 the whole of the of the MENA and the Gulf and the Gulf region. Um, uh, Andreas, a, a final word from you on this on this uh, sort of like. Uh, um, uh, international uh, alliances, and you know, obviously, the big absent in this uh, is is Brussels. You know, and I, I, we haven't heard anything. Uh, is it is it uh, uh, totally um, negligible the 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 ties that Doha has with Brussels? Well, I mean, I think Brussels. As for everyone external, and now I'm sitting in London, I'm actually now external to the EU. Uh, I, I think Brussels is a bit of a, um, it, it's still in the Gulf um, misunderstood in terms of what it can deliver. And in terms of foreign and security policy, which is everything, every debate in the Gulf at the moment revolves around security and security paranoia and the withdrawal of the United States. And what they see is that the Europeans are not really picking up um, you know, where the Americans have left off, they are not really filling that gap, and they haven't done uh, in, in a very long time. That includes individual nation states in Europe, but also obviously also the EU. So there's a bit of disenfranchisement among Gulf states when it comes to Europe, and that's not just in Qatar, that's particularly in the UAE. I think the UAE are probably the one Gulf country that has invested the most in Brussels in terms of networks, in terms of, you know, think tanks, uh, in terms of subverting uh, members of the European Parliament and kind of influence operations. Uh, the countries haven't really played that game also because they don't see it as valuable. Um, and I, I don't think that Brussels is as relevant to the Gulf as you know some people in Brussels might, might make it out to be. Um, but let me say a few words about um, Beijing and Moscow because we haven't touched upon this. So I don't want to go back to, to you know, we, I think we, we very well established that competition in Washington that, that was going on. The countries though for why, for why, for, for why um, Qatar sees Washington as so detrimental and so important to their foreign and security policy is the fact that they, as I said before, put all their eggs in the American basket. Um, unlike the UAE, for example, the UAE have really diversified in a way of saying, you know, the, the self-perception again here is entirely different. Qatar sees itself as a small state. Um, they have their own individual uh, soft power uh, avenues, but in essence, they are a small power. They don't seem to, they don't want to play uh, or play one great power against the other. The UAE, on the other hand, have the confidence of being seen, they want to be seen as a middle power. They want to be seen on par with Saudi Arabia. And as a middle power, they're saying, if the Americans withdraw, as Emma already said, we, can, we have to stand on our own two feet, also militarily. And where much of their operations uh, in Yemen or in Somalia or in, in Libya and in other parts of Africa are sustained by surrogates and, and rebel groups and mercenaries, they have invested in hard power in the way that, that the countries haven't. The countries have said from the beginning, when it comes to hard power and defense, it is about, while we have our own capability, it is all about the Americans. So losing Washington was for the countries always more detrimental and more uh, problematic than for the Emiratis. The Emiratis have diversified. And if you speak to the Emiratis today, they will give you an entirely different uh, outlook on what is going on in the region. And again, the security paranoia post-Trump um, is a Iran is now off the lead. 
Uh, B, uh, America has withdrawn in Afghanistan, giving rise to non-state actors such as the Taliban that will eventually threaten uh, the UAE. And the UAE now have to fend for themselves, which means they have to forge their own partnerships with Russia as well as with China. And for both Russia and China, the UAE are the most important partner in the Arab world by far. Uh, that's particularly true for China when it comes to development of uh, cyber technology um, and, and information technology. Um, it's about sharing even when it comes to the, the COVID-19 response. Um, when it comes to Russia as well, um, the UAE have, are the country in the Arab world that have most uh, intensely invested and cooperated with the Russians, especially in Libya, uh, you know, where the UAE have financed uh, mercenary operations by the Russians, uh, training operations for the Russians, where they've provided infrastructure for the Russians. Um, it also, but also in Yemen. In southern Yemen, we've seen Russian um, dignitaries going and meeting the uh, members of the SDC, again, proxy of the UAE. So in, 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 that, in, that, in that kind of environment, the countries are very much playing a pro, have taken a very pro-Western approach. And I think that is very, very different from how the UAE are playing it. The UAE is saying, we don't put our, all our basket in the, in the Western, uh, all, all our eggs in the Western basket, but we're actually diversifying. And the countries haven't really built a strong relationship with China. It's a relationship that's based on energy, uh, whereby I would even make go as far as saying that the countries quite have a lot of leverage over the Chinese because the Chinese need uh, are quite dependent on gas from, from Qatar. And the countries really don't, haven't developed a political uh, relationship in the way that the Emiratis have with the Chinese. And the same goes to Russia. It's, a, it's an energy relationship, and that's it. There is no political relationship. There is no security relationship with Russia or with the Chinese. And, and that, that makes it kind of uh, different in terms of where, uh, where the countries stand on all that. Um, um, but th one thing about Khaliginess, because I think it's a very interesting discussion. And um, I would say that Khaliginess is something that way predates statehood and also predates um, uh, the, the formation of the GCC. I know the GCC has really tried to foster some of it, but I think the mentality of being Khaliji is, is, is based on a common history where you know, these borders and everything that we see today are political constructs that only came about in, in the second half of the 20th century. So it, they are very much artificial. And while nationhood is on the rise, Khaliginess is always somewhat um, you know, taken precedence. And, and I think this the very first time that we see Khaliginess taking a back seat is when we look at 2017. And as Emma already said, it, it, it was something that for the first time involved the people of the region. And it has scarred the, the, the people of the region in a way that an entire generation of Khalijis, particularly in Qatar, will not just automatically go back to Saudi Arabia and to Dubai and, and pretend nothing has happened. Um, and I, I'm not sure that within that generation, the, 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 the cracks, and it's probably more than cracks, that the fault lines uh, will actually be overcome as quickly as some people make it out to be. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Andreas. Uh, I'm wondering how our friends, the interpreters, will be translating Khaliginess. It's a tricky one in Spanish. Um, but um, uh, I, I wanted to uh, move on to that mediating role. And uh, Andreas has just sort of like uh, um, destroyed my title in terms of middle power. Uh, you think it is not? It's the UAE who are the mediate, uh, the, the middle power, and Qatar sees itself as a small power. But so you know, maybe that's a, a question we can we can get into uh, in our uh, fifth segment. So this mediating role that Qatar has been keen on exercising for some time now, uh, we've we, we've seen them play in Lebanon, in Sudan, in Yemen. Uh, you know, they have invested time and resources. And the, the, the Qataris have sought to position themselves as neutral peacemakers. Uh, they have also uh, done lower profile uh, efforts in Palestine, in the Eritrean Djibouti um, the border, uh, but probably the most recent and let's say central in current affairs is the Taliban uh, US uh, mediating role. So what, what are the reasons you'd say, and the modus operandi, how do they do this? And the results, pretty much, of such efforts. Uh, uh, will they be mediating between Iran and the Saudis, for instance? Is it such a, you know, um, large role? Are they comfortable in doing this? Um, Emma? Thank you so much for this question. Um, 
Well, as, as you mentioned, being a mediator was Qatar's strategy of choice from the beginning. Uh, the reasons uh, were to gain safety in numbers by being friends with everyone, but also carve itself a specific role in the region in a way, actually, that did not please uh, bigger neighbors, such as Saudi Arabia, of course, but also Egypt, because they were usually involved in mediation in, for instance, Sudan and in Yemen. Um, Another reason, and, and that ties to more recent uh, examples of that, is to make itself an indispensable actor for outside powers. Uh, in terms of the modus operandi, I would say uh, that it has relied a lot of it on uh, economic diplomacy with good results. Um, and as, as we already discussed, uh, against the backdrop of the Arab Spring, Qatar moved away from this position as a neutral mediator, um, but resumed these efforts recently. And I would say the, the, the fact that uh, Doha resumed with these, uh, with these previous efforts has probably a lot to do with the 2017 crisis, but also uh, to the a certain pragmatic outlook on the way the region has evolved and the new landscape as it is confirming itself post Arab Spring today, um, that that justifies that Qatar would would go back to uh, its its previous uh, strategy. What I would say, uh, perhaps, uh, is that through uh, the mediation between the Taliban and the United States, Qatar has adopted a stance that it actually closer to that of Oman, maybe. And uh, that, in a way, uh, Qatar, by playing this role, is uh, putting itself as an indispensable actor to the, the United States as a sort of diplomatic outpost for Washington, in a way that Washington almost, um, and I discussed this recently with someone, that the fact that uh, Washington could almost see Qatar as a, a a key actor in, in a certain externalization of some state function when it comes to diplomacy. Uh, and, like uh, it would be like the Switzerland of the Gulf. <laughs> exactly, the Switzerland of the Gulf. Um, so um, I, I think to, to this extent, in this sense, the mediation that Qatar is, is, is uh, uh, has helped between the US and the Taliban is a new form of mediation. It's going back to the, the idea of mediation for all the reasons that, 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 I, that I talked about, but with, with a, a, a new twist to it. When it comes to, uh, could Qatar have the ambition to uh, mediate between Iran and Saudi Arabia? Perhaps, uh, but to be honest, I am not sure that they would necessarily be the best place to do so. And the one one of the reasons why I say that is that I think it's important to remember that the 2017 Gulf crisis was supposedly partly because of the ties uh, between Qatar and Tehran, uh, and also because it could certainly uh, create additional problems between Saudi Arabia and the UAE that are already, uh, you know, they are increasing tensions between these two countries. And so having Qatar officially mediate between Saudi Arabia and Iran could make, uh, could create additional problems uh, within the GCC between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, I would argue. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Andreas, do you think there is a new twist in the mediation power of Qatar? Yes and no, but I think the Taliban aren't the, the real twist. I think post um, Hamad bin Khalifa, we've seen a couple of these twists. And going back to the future for Qatar also meant low risk. Uh, I think taking a lot of risk during the Arab Spring, burning your fingers during during the process of that, meant that Tamim, and he, Tamim generally is a fairly risk averse decision maker in comparison to his father. Uh, it also meant you know taking a low risk approach. So only endorsing the sort of mediation efforts that are you know, that provide where Qatar is provided with a monopoly or with a, a, a very special a monopoly on the relationship and a, a special access point. So rather than seeking out opportunities proactively uh, and almost desperately as they have done before 
um, you know, before the Arab Spring, Qatar is now a lot more strategic in their choice of where they mediate, because they've seen that some of these engagement with particularly non-state actors, but also engagement with Iran, um, were, were really risk uh, for in the Gulf context, you know, much of the Gulf crisis was about also was also about Qatar's engagement with non-state actors. So uh, Qatar had to be careful here that they make sure, first of all, when they take on mediation roles, that they do this with the consent of the United States and in close partnership with the United States, and also that they kind of be you know, mindful, at least, in terms of what potentially their Gulf neighbors might think about it. Although I think this is after the Gulf crisis, this has become uh, a bit less of a concern. But it's primarily making sure that the US is consent um, or is content with that sort of engagement. And I think the most important relationship that we've seen is the relationship with Hamas. Again, that, and that is something that goes, again, back uh, more than a decade. And here the countries have cultivated and nurtured a network in Palestine that makes them a key broker between Israel, Hamas, um, and the United States in a way that, no, again, no other Gulf Arab state has been able to play it. And while Egypt has taken somewhat the, the lead in, 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 um, in at least, uh, you know, getting, trying to get the, the um, uh, you know, the, the, the praise for what happened in, during the Gaza war earlier this year, it was the countries who really brokered that deal. And it's, again, based on the fact that the countries have trust by non-state actors that many other state actors don't have. Um, you know, the Taliban office, for example, was something that was in the, um, um, you know, in negotiation for a long period of time. The Obama administration a decade ago was looking for someone who could play the role of a broker. And the Saudis and the, and the Emiratis both were offering these services, but it was the Taliban who said, we don't want to speak to them. We don't trust them, but we do trust the countries because they do act as a neutral player that has no ulterior motives. And the countries have no ulterior motives in Afghanistan. And the countries also don't have any ulterior motives when it comes to Palestine. The countries are quite, you know, quite frank with how, where they stand in the conflict between Israel and Palestine, and that they, you know, they support the two-state solution. Um, and and, and in, in that way, the countries are a trusted partner, both for the Israelis and for Hamas. And that, again, there is a, they have acquired a monopoly uh, over that relationship that no one else can tap into. And that came at low risk because, again, they, they did a favor for the Americans. And the Taliban is very much a replication of that, where, again, they, as Emma said, they, they act as an extension of, um, of, of the U.S. government and kind of the, out, the diplomatic outpost for the Americans. And the fact that Doha has become now the hub for anything Afghanistan is quite remarkable. So not just in terms of U.S. engagement with the region, but you have the U.K. embassy in Kabul is now uh, in, in, in Doha, as is the Dutch embassy, a lot of you know, the American University of Afghanistan or Kabul is relocated to Qatar. So Qatar has become very much the hub for anything Afghanistan, a, you know, a great role, um, great position to be in. Um, but for the most part, I think that the countries, um, the country networks have, you know, they have been, they have expanded, but based on, you know, with, with low risk. And the financial wealth that the countries have, as well as their, um, you know, the, also the willingness to use it, make them a more potent broker and mediator than the Omanis, for example. Um, the Omanis have their, they're in, unstable, in a very unstable situation. Um, they're being squeezed by the Emirat, by Emirati interest and Saudi interest. Um, they're financially bankrupt, which again makes them uh, very much, um, you know, vulnerable to exploitation from outside. The countries don't have these vulnerabilities. They are nobody's playing ball in the region, and thereby they can stand with certain confidence on as a mediator in a way that the, the Omanis can't. And the Omanis have come under a lot of pressure recently over their relationship with Iran, over their relationship uh, with the Houthis, for example, where there is influence uh, being put upon Muscat to actually bend um, their mediation role. And that makes them a fairly weak mediator in the way that the countries are not. So you need to have some sort of true autonomy, trust, um, and also financial independence to be able to actually play that role in the way that the that the that the countries um, uh, have done. A uh, few words on the Iran relationship, though. The countries have now really come out and said, "Oh, we're happy to also mediate there. We're part of the Aluna negotiations." And um, the countries have raised that a couple of times in in in, in talks with the Saudis. They said, "We're very happy to offer you a, a a backdoor channel if you want to." But it's the Saudis who've chosen against, you know, chosen um, um, Iraq over over Qatar. There's still a lot of a, a lot of lack of trust when it comes to Qatar. Um, as I said, the Alula process is a process that will take years and years, if ever, to return to a pre-2017 status quo. Um, but, um, you know, the countries have offered it, but I think the Saudis will not uh, play along. But the countries have, a, again, a very important relationship with the Iranians that make the countries, again, 
very attractive as a partner for other Western countries, including the UK and the United States. So um, it's, it's kind of monopolizing unique relationships that no one else has and, 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 and really uh, capitalizing on it. And, and I think that's something that the countries have done very, very well. Mm -hmm. So diplom in diplomatic terms, there are no small power. No, they are a small, they want to be perceived as a small power because if you, and, and it's about, it's the optic of it. The countries don't want to appear like an assertive player. And I think we've seen in the, U, the UAE have really burned their hands truth post 2014 until now, over the last seven years in Libya, in a Yemen, in the Horn of Africa, they, they position themselves as a very assertive player as a middle power um, is playing zero sum games with major powers and um, in great powers actually, um, and thereby have create them put themselves into a box now where it's very difficult to emerge from. Um, that image is something that the countries don't want. So they say we're a small power, we're happy to mediate, but in real terms, when it comes to what matters in the 21st century, is not how many tanks you have and how many uh, troops you can uh, expedition somewhere. It's about you know, it's about influence, it's about information, it's about uh, whose story wins. And I think that is very important. The countries have understood that their story, their narrative is winning at the moment. And that is more important uh, than actually how many boots on the ground you could put somewhere or uh, you know, anything that you could achieve with hard power. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Neil, uh, final word from you. Uh, we're starting to, to close the, the session. Um, so Andreas has mentioned uh, the ability of uh, the uh, Qatari diplomacy quite uniquely uh, to be trusted by non-state actors. And somehow this, this leads me to the, uh, the, 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 the question of uh, this, uh, this, these dynamics and this mediating role uh, of, of Qatar has acquired so much uh, uh, let's say significance because also of the way power has been fragmented in the region, and so we have so so many important non-state actors, uh, and that makes Qatar unique somehow in its mediating power. Yeah, I think I think it does. Um, but I mean, you've you've had two very comprehensive answers here from from An Andreas and, and, and Emma. And I think the point that Andreas was making is that the Qataris like to have this you know, monopoly on relationships, he called it. And I think if, if one looks at those relationships with non-state actors, and, and indeed state actors, but non-state actors specifically, they, they are basically the only actor that can have those relationships. I mean, you know, it's really uh, worked closely with the Taliban over the years. Um, probably much to the chagrin or frustration of some of the Western powers, but that, that's now really showing fruit. It was, as, as Andrea said, that was probably a low risk calculation, but they've invested and nurtured those, those networks over time. They've, they've, they've done so, they've put themselves in there with Hamas. Um, where we are at the moment, this feels, this reminds me of sort of, you know, just pre-intervention in, 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 in Libya, when you know Qatar's stock was really, really high, um, and Qatar was really much sort of seen as providing the um, the cloak of respectability for you know the UN Security Council to come through for 1973 to come into being and for the intervention to actually happen. And I sort of see Qatar being there with the Taliban at the moment, having that relationship with Hamas, being in a similar position. But this is the new Qatar. This is where that lower risk element comes in. I don't think it's going to dive off the board and you know do, do what it did back in the day. I think it is going to be much more calculated and much more choosy about um, the, those those non-state actors that it can work with, but all working to serve as an interlocutor for the U.S. I think I think I think that that is the key. Rather than going off piece and and doing its own thing, I think it's going to be you know much more in lockstep with, with the US and, and their main powers. Um, in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, Iran and Saudis, I, I don't see them playing a role as, as mediator there for all the reasons that we've heard. But also, I mean, I, I think at the moment, the Saudis, uh, they're not entirely happy with bilateral, the status of bilateral discussions, but they're already engaged in bilateral discussions. Um, but I would say that, you know, Doha finds itself in a really advantageous position 
for all those reasons that Andreas you know, just said, it can be that neutral player. It has the economic diplomacy that, that Emma spoke about. It has those key relationships that no other state in the region really has. Um, it just needs to play that hand very, very carefully. And I'm sure all of us watching their, you know, their, their important and critical role in Afghanistan at the moment hopes that they can, you know, that they, they can hold on to that tightly and that things go as they as they should, because you know things can change uh, overnight and they could find themselves almost coming off a precipice again. But I'm sure those lessons have been learned. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Neil uh, Quilliam, Associate Fellow with the Middle East and North Africa Program at Chatham House, Andreas Krieg, Senior Lecturer at the School of Security Studies at King's College London, and Emma Soubrier, uh, Professorial Lecturer and Visiting Scholar at the Institute for Middle East Studies at the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Uh, I think it's it's really been uh, we've covered a lot. We've uh, uh, really uh, you know gone through the 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 uh, uh, initial uh, push towards uh, Qatar becoming this relevant actor to uh, uh, untangling some of its very complex relations with its neighbors, uh, with also uh, with also Washington, Ankara. Uh, uh, with uh, we've covered Khaliginess as well that I'm sure would like to explore even more in the in the near future. Uh, what is clear is that uh, uh, Qatar is a strategic hub, uh, uh, both in, in terms of uh, energy, of uh, the economics of the Middle East, but also in terms of uh, diplomacy and international relations. Uh, and, and definitely, as the French would say, Emma, incontournable. Uh, it's really a, a, a state that we want to focus in uh, and we'll be definitely uh, covering this more in the near future. Thank you very much to uh, all three of you and to your institutions. Uh, and we uh, hope to connect very soon or maybe even uh, see you here in, uh, in Madrid uh, in, in the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.